All right, so we're talking about uh, tonight uh, some, some principles to uh, instill into uh, the young men. And um, so one of the things I want to look at tonight is, is uh, in Colossians 1, verse 9. It says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So he says he prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, you know, uh, you know, when you're dealing with this thing of the principles for the young women and principles for the young men, man, there's just so much territory you can cover. And there's a lot of just general spiritual truths that always apply. Um, but I want to talk to you just, just for a few minutes on, uh, a, I'm going to hit a few thoughts, but one of them is just, um, that thought of discernment. We mentioned it again. Uh, we mentioned it last week. Um, you know, our, our, our young guys, our young men, uh, we want them to have discernment because they're going to be leading homes and they're going to be leading somebody else's daughters. And if it was your daughter and you're handing him off to this guy, uh, you know, you want to have some confidence in his discernment. But discernment is one of those things that is very, very um, really lacking. And discernment is the ability to see through something. Um, it's the ability to to really get the big picture and just to have that that sense of exactly what's going on. Yeah, they're telling you this and and it's painted in 12 different colors. But but, you know, if you've got discernment. You know, if there's something wrong with it, discernment says, you know, I, I'm not sure about this, you know. And, and so um, often, and you guys know this, often things are not as they appear. And um, a lot of times only a person with discernment spots it. And the problem is in our society, discernment seems to be a very, um, it, it's, there's not a whole lot of it around. And, um, so we need to teach our young men some things. So one of the things along this line is we need to teach them to be able to uh, do some research, to do some reading. Um, you know, we, we live in an age where people, um, they, uh, they don't do, um, they, I, I'm, I'm speaking generically, of course, but they don't do a pile of reading. Um, and, and you have to be on your guard. Now, here's discernment. And, and you have to be on your guard because just because you look something up on Google, and you know, you, you got to remember now you can find some good information. Not all the good information has been wiped off Google. But there are a lot of things. You know, Google does control the flow of information. And, and so they what's posted on Google is what they want posted. And, you know, one of the things you learn as you begin to do research and try to look things up is there's sometimes you can't find what you're looking for on Google. And so you've got to learn to branch outside of that. And, and can I say, can I say the truth is not hard to find. It's just the way it is. You know, people say, well, you know, I just don't have, don't have time to do all that reading. Well, I, I'm not talking about, you know, locking yourself in your, your room and doing six months of reading. I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about the ability, you know, and you need to encourage this with your sons. You need, they need to be able, you should be able to say, you know, do some, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, you know, do, do some, do some research on tortoises. Okay. Um, you know, you should make him dig, you know, no, don't go to, what is it? Chat GPT or whatever it's called. You know, no, don't, don't go to Google and press the print button. No, give me three or four or five sources and do some digging. And they need to learn how to do that. Because what happens is if you don't know how to do that, you become um, prey to anybody that sounds like they know what they're talking about. And there are a lot of these people that are carrying Christians astray, make it sound like they know what they're talking about. And they're not telling you the truth. I mean, they are absolutely not telling you the truth. Um, they need to be able to, and I'm going to say several things are going to overlap in the next few minutes. They need to, they need to think, they need to think. 
Um, look, guys, I, I know you know this, but but this that's not that's not a real friend of thinking. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what this is? This is not. We have no deaf people in here. This is not sign language. I'm talking about gaming. You know, um, um, we we need to train our. And I'm not saying they can't ever play a video game. I'm not saying that. But you know, you know where our world's at. Our world is um, every free minute they got, they're on a screen. Okay, and we're going to talk about that probably on another evening. Uh, but but all you young guys in here, can I encourage you to do something like with a vengeance? Um, you you get a hold of yourself and uh, limit yourself. Uh, you know, parents, you need to limit it. That that's not the babysitter, and that's not going to help them. You they need to you need to put books. We've talked about this before recently. I got up here uh, two or three months ago, and I read an article about it is a proven fact that the way your brain processes information off the printed page is very different from a screen. And I, I, I really questioned that when I first heard it. I thought, really? Can it be that different? And then they began to explain the way the brain works with the printed page. The brain works on the printed page. It does its, It's called mapping. And your brain is literally taking snapshots and it, and it, it maps, you know, your Bible, you know, I, you know, a lot of you guys know this. If you read your Bible, you, uh, you get your Bible and you read it and you read it and you read it. And, and, and somebody says something, you go, Oh, it's, it's over here on this page, right over in this corner. You know why that, you know why you know that? Cause your brain mapped it. Your brain can't map when it's doing this. And so it affects your memory. It affects what you retain. You retain what you read from paper far better. I, I'm not saying you can't research things online. I research things online. But I got a ton of books too. We need to put books in their hand. Real quick. And we, we quote this verse a lot, but look at 1 Thessalonians 5. Our young men, our young men, to some extent, they need to be readers. Now, I, I realize, you know, if, if you, you, you know, these guys, you, you, you're going to, they're going to learn a trade. They're going to get a career. You know, they're going to be working a lot. And, and that's all reasonable. That's all understandable. That's all normal. And, and, you know, they're going to have a family. So their reading time is going to be limited. Okay. I understand that. But can I tell you what I observed? My dad got saved when I was six years old. My dad worked a lot of long hours. A lot of long hours. And uh, right after he got saved, I don't know why, but the preacher put my dad, the, the church wanted to have a church library. And so the preacher put my dad in charge of the church library. And I remember my dad laying across the bed. And our, our bed, you know, you know, back in those days, you know, you didn't you didn't need a, a vault to jump into your bed. You know, a lot of these beds are so high now, but it, it was lower to the floor. And I can remember dad laying across the floor and there's a book on the floor. And he's got the book. open. He's reading. And uh, my dad, the first two years he was saved, he read and he read and he read and he was reading Bible truth stuff. And, and he literally it got his feet on the ground. We're talking 1969. My dad had the King James issue down in 1969. And a lot of the King James guys were just starting to pump out information. And my dad latched onto that, got hold of it, started reading. And um, you know what? He, he, he wasn't a professional with an office that had 12 hours a day to read. But you know what he was doing? He was just reading when he could. There's a saying, and you don't need to do this. But but I read this not long. Man, I got a fly buzzing around my head. <laughs> Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. Um, somebody said this, okay? And 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 I think first of all, first of all, your Bible reading should be first of all. So by having said that, one guy said, if you picked a subject 
Okay. And for the next five years, you read one hour a day on that subject. One out, one hour. That's reasonable. Five years from now, you would be literally an outstanding authority on that subject. See, it's, we, we, you know, sometimes we create this mountain in our mind and we say, oh, I can't do that. Oh, you, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised what you can do. Just a few minutes here, a few minutes there. But we need to teach our sons. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. I cannot overemphasize this verse. Our young men need to get a hold of this verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. In other words, test it. Make sure it's really true. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Go to Acts 17. Another famous, famous verse. When I say read and research and think, you know, of course, your Bible falls right into that category. Acts 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent, sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, these Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And here it is. And... Search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Paul was impressed with them. You know why? Because they, they didn't just believe it because he said it. Paul said, I like these guys. He said, because everything I said, they opened their Bible and they checked it. They checked it. What a good thing to teach our young men. And I realize some of these things, you know, could apply to women as well. But I'm just saying. What a thing. We need to teach our young men to be discerning, okay? And we need to teach them to recognize intimidation. We need to teach them to recognize when they are being browbeat into something. You know, a lot of these internet guys, a lot of, I, and I've, I've been in a couple churches that turned very cultic. And, um, and I, I, was, I was sitting in the pew like you are. And all I knew was things started really get, getting crazy and, and, and um, the preaching started getting extremely controlling and they were trying to control our private lives and all this stuff. And, um, and they would say things so forcefully and, and in such a harsh way. And yet, and yet they, they would almost make it, it sounded spiritual. And they almost made it sound like if you questioned them, you weren't right with God. And, uh, and man, it just, and, and when you're sitting in there, it's in your, you, you're in there and you're in it and, um, and you're, you sort of been there a while and you sort of get used to it and you're thinking, you're thinking, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe this is right, you know? And, and the next thing you know, you're believing something, you're doing something, you're making a decision. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with the Holy ghost. It's just because you were intimidated. Oh, uh, you can't be with this person. Um, two or three times in my life when I was in those churches. I've got two instances in my mind right now, two, two separate times. It was my misfortune to fall into two of them. And I think the Lord let me fall into two of them so I would never forget. And um, one day the pastor says, uh, you need to call so-and-so that family over there. And you need to tell them you're not going to have anything to do with them anymore. I said, okay. I was young. I was 30. I was very loyal. I had been taught that the pastor's a man of God and you do what he says. And you know what? I did it because you know what? I, I thought I was doing the right thing, but I was being intimidated. Well, several years later, happened again. This one preacher told me, he said, you know, at, at another one, of these same deal. He said, you need, you need to stop having anything to do with so-and-so. Now, now look, if it had been a church discipline scenario and, and it was somebody committing adultery and they'd already lured three other women, and uh, of course. But it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. And I found myself being 
cornered into doing things. We need to teach our young men to learn to spot that. Our young men need to be teachable. They need to be sweet. They, they, they need to be cooperative. But they need to learn not to be intimidated. They need to learn. They need to learn. And some of this takes time. And some of it will take things like, you know, you'll, you'll, as you'll be the dad or the mom, and you'll see a situation unfold. And then you'll take that as a learning thing. And you'll, you'll talk to your kids and you say, you see what's happened over there? Say, you know, th this is this is all haywire and here is why. And you're going to explain it to them. And, and, and they, they'll learn from that and then and then uh, hopefully they won't repeat that. You need to they need to learn to recognize politics. You say the Democrats and Republicans? No. I'm talking about church politics. You know, there there's uh there's there's things that go on and and um and there's things that people do, and it's um, oh, if if you want to be, you know, you you can't, you believe that? Well, you you really, you know, you, we're not going to have anything to do with you. And then you get these things where people are afraid to to. Um, well, well, if I do that, then you know, all these people they're gonna they're gonna treat me weird if I believe this. If I go to this meeting, hello, young man. Be a man and don't be swayed by the politics. You say, well, they'll, they'll cut me off. They sure will. You got that right? And you'll be the better for it because you stood on your own two feet. And they won't like you. And they'll talk bad about you and they'll blackball you and they'll all get together and for a while. You'll be the topic of conversation. I do remember a famous man of long ago that said, blessed are you. When men shall revile you and shall separate you from their company and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. The Lord said, for great is your reward in heaven. That herd pressure, that herd pressure. You need to teach your young men. Um, you know, there, there is just sometimes, boy, just in, in, in something comes up, you get around a certain group and, um, and boy, there's just that pressure. And you know what? You, you need to teach your young men. And, you know, they're going to learn some of that from you. They're going to learn some of that from you. But they need to, uh, by watching you, I'm saying. But they need to learn. Man, when you're being pushed, that's a red flag. Always. And the Bible has a word for that. You know, you say, what's the Bible word for intimidation and pressure? It's called oppression. Uh, I think it's end of Proverbs chapter three. It says, envy thou not the oppressor. The oppressor is a person that they're just, they're just forcing their way and they're, they're controlling everybody against their will. And they're going to, they're going to make you conform. Okay. And of course we understand that we understand that governmentally, and all the things we've seen, you know, here in our country and all that. Um, but it happens in Christian circles. The Bible word is oppression or oppressor. Our sons, they, they should be teachable. You know, there never should be a day. And, and boy, I've been around some. Oh, my word. That they've just got this air about them. They just, they just, oh, they just look at me and they're like, what are you going to teach me, old man? And you know what? I don't care. It doesn't hurt my feelings. But they're in trouble with God. Not because I'm anybody, but because when you start getting that attitude that you know it all and you can't be taught. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Our young, our sons should be teachable. They should remain teachable. Look, guys, you know, you guys know I'm 60 years old and um, I still I I love going to preach here and preaching. I love uh, meetings. I love reading. I, I still want to learn if, if, if I'm wrong somewhere uh, or is there more information? Can I get some fresh insight somewhere? I want to learn. I want to learn. Teachable, humble but not intimidated. 
We need to teach our sons to think logically and to reason and examine things. Um, you know how sometimes how you can do that, dads or moms. And you know, your mom, you you have an influence on your sons, a, a big influence. Um, you know, sometimes you can do it by asking them a question. But ask them a question. The Lord provides opportunities. They're just a lot of times they're they're all over the place if you just if you have eyes to see them. And um, in a church we attended, I was about, I don't know, I was nine or 10 years old, eight or nine, somewhere in there. And they had a youth group. It was a big church. They, I mean, literally, they ran a thousand on Sunday morning. And um, so on Sunday nights before the main service, we had youth group. So youth group was like at 545 and the main church service was at seven o'clock. So mom and dad were there, you know, because we we're like some of you guys. We drove a long way to church. And um, so we'd be there. It was, it, was, it was an okay place. It really was. And that night, the youth leader got up. And I don't know, I don't know what he was. Um, I don't remember the point, you know. I mean, I'm just a kid. You know, kids don't remember all that. But I do remember what happened. And he, he was teaching on the difference between sin and unrighteousness. And he said something like this. He said, now sin is something you do on purpose. But unrighteousness is something you do ignorantly. You really don't know you've done it. And unrighteousness really isn't sin at all. And so I'm just a little kid. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm just there for the ride and the fun and popcorn. And, the, you know, and, and so uh, so I come out, you know, youth group's over. And um, dad and mom are sitting in the pew. So I'm, I'm sitting beside dad. Church is going to start in a few minutes. And dad goes, so how do youth group go tonight? I said, we're well, really good. And we attended that church for quite a while. Dad said, so what'd you learn tonight? I said, well, I saw, I learned you the difference between sin and unrighteousness. And so I gave him the spiel. I said, sin is what you do on purpose. And unrighteousness is, is what you do, but you don't really know you did it. You did it ignorantly and it's not sin. And my dad goes, he goes, no son. He said, think about that just a minute. Think about sin and unrighteousness. That's okay. He said, do you know any verses that come to your mind about that? And I don't know why, but first John 5, 21 came to my mind. I looked at my dad. I said, all unrighteousness is sin. That's what it says. And my dad smiled and he said, yep, you got it. You know what he did? I, I, was, I was amazing because the dude in, in youth group, he wasn't trying to deceive us. He probably got his information from somebody else. He was trying to help us. But you know what he did? Is he taught us something that was false. You know what corrected it? A verse from the Bible. A verse in the Bible. We need to encourage our sons to follow things to their logical conclusion. People say things, people spew statements out. And you know, just, just sometimes at first glance, it, it sounds reasonable. But um, but if you follow some some people, their statements, some some things they believe. Uh, if you just sit there and think about it, okay, so if you do that, and then, and well, that's going to lead to this, and then that's going to lead to this, and oh, woo, that's wrong. But, you know, a lot of people, they don't, they don't follow things to their logical conclusion. Um, but having said all that, there must be a healthy distrust of yourself. Um, go to the book of Proverbs. I was talking about doing research and looking things up. And um, you, you guys remember a few a few uh, services ago, I, I put these out there and I, I've still got a bunch of them. And it's called, When Was the Pre-Trib Rapture First Taught? Because we here at Capital City Baptist Church, we are diehards on the pre-trib rapture. And uh, not because we're stubborn and not because we got it from some Bible college somewhere, but because the Bible teaches that plainly and clearly. And um, but there's groups out there that they're just they, they make a big stink and they, they think we're heretics and all that stuff. And one of the things they'll say is, well, you know, nobody taught that till 1850. And it's John Darby's fault. 
and they'll just wax eloquent on that. And then they'll tell us all how stupid we are. You know what they're hoping you do? They're hoping you don't do any research. I've got umpteen pages here. Quotes. And, and sure, they didn't believe identically everything we believe. But they all believed that God was going to take his people out before he judged the earth. And it goes all the way back to the second, third century. So when, but, but they're just going to tell you something and see if you don't do any reading, you're going to go, oh, I guess we have been believing the wrong thing. No, no. That's why we need to teach our sons to do a little research. Um, look at Proverbs 3. You guys can quote this verse. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And that's often what we emphasize in this verse. But the next phrase says, and lean not. He didn't say, don't use your understanding. We're supposed to use it. But he said, but be careful about leaning on it. Trust in the Lord. There's only one person that you can lean on, and it'll never take you astray. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. Look at Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. He's just saying, don't, don't trust yourself. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Look at um, Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. Well, I've heard some guys, even in the last six months, and somebody will say, somebody will say, you know, I'm trying to really be careful here. They'll say, I've learned not to trust myself. Boy, that's a real mark of, of growing in grace. Look at Proverbs 26, <coughs> verse 16. The sluggard, that means the lazy guy, is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render reason. So here's this guy, you know, he's sitting on his hiney. His house is falling apart. He's not paying his bills. And, you know, it, but he's fine. He, he's not, he's not ill. You know, he's just, he's just lazy, you know. And, um, and so picture seven men come to his door from the church. And they're all going to help him. Brother, come on now. You can do this. And the first guy tries to cheer him on. The second guy tries to reason with him. The third guy threatens him. And the fourth guy says, what are you going to do about your finances? And, and seven men try to reason with him. But you know what, Mr. Lazy Heine? He's smarter than all of them. <laughs> you know what? You, you, can't, you can't tell him nothing. Because in it, he, he looks at himself in the mirror and goes, you smart looking thing, you. <laughs> He's wise in his own conceit. Look at verse 12 of the same chapter. 26, 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? He's the smartest man around. There is more hope of a fool than of him. In Proverbs 3, verse 7, it says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Be not wise. It doesn't mean that you don't have, you know, you, you gain experience. And, uh, man, you've got some good sense, you know, hopefully. And, and, and it doesn't mean that you don't use your head. But, but there's times when um, you just need to take a step back and go, Lord, am I, am I really seeing this clear? Somebody says something to you and you go, Lord, is it really, is that really true what they're telling me? And, but see, you don't do that. If you, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you know, you're just, Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. well, what well, I think it, mm -hmm. we don't want our young men to be that way because it's going to hurt them. It's going to hurt the relationships. It's going to hurt their friendships. It's going to hurt their reputation. It's going to hurt their marriage. We need to teach our young men. And I, I'm going to close with this one. To know themselves. And that's going to take some time. You know what we all are, men and women in here? We, we All of us, we, um, we're all different, you know. Um, and and that's, that's a good thing. Um, we've all got strengths and weaknesses. But we need we need to know ourselves. 
Uh, some of you guys, you, uh, you, you, you know your strengths and you know your weaknesses. But you'd be amazed at the people that don't know their, their weaknesses um, and their strengths. They know them, but, but they're so confident in them that their, their strengths become a weakness. Um, some people are good with this. Some people are not good with this. You know, some people are some people are just really, really good with money. Some people are just really, really intelligent, and sharp. Some people are just really good with their hands. Uh, some people just have great intuition. And and, um, you know, whatever you need to know yourself, you, you need to look yourself in the mirror and go, OK, you know what? I, I'm, I'm OK here and I'm pretty good here. But man, I'm weak there and I'm weak there and I'm weak there. And what that is, is being honest with yourself. You know, no true growth. You, you can't help people. God can't help people when they reach a place where they're just not honest with themselves. Can you look yourself in the mirror and just be honest? You know, you, you ever been praying about something? I'm sure none of you have ever done this. I'm probably the only one. But I'm praying about something and I'm telling God why I want him to do this. And there's this little tiny voice down in my heart that goes, that's not the real reason. And I'm trying to ignore it as I pray. And, and finally, I realize my, my prayer is hitting the ceiling. And I gotta, I'll go, okay, Lord. My motive is wrong. And so then I gotta say, now, Lord, help me to pray right about this. How do I do this, Lord? And all of a sudden, you can get somewhere. Um, half the Christian life is being honest with yourself. Half of your relationships is being honest with yourself. Man, so much in life. Ground is gained or lost. Preaching changes someone or it doesn't. Somebody's touched and somebody's not. And, and, and you know why the person wasn't helped? Because they weren't honest with themselves. We need to teach our young men to know their strengths and their weaknesses, and to be honest with themselves. Psalm 36, and we're done. This is the verse on that. Psalm 36. Psalm 36. Verse 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart, that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For, here it is, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. In other words, he's got this inflated thing. He looks at himself in the mirror and he just, you know what? He, he doesn't see who he really is. If you want to write the reference down, I'll give you two references. Proverbs 21, 2. In Proverbs 18, 17. Proverbs 21, 2. Proverbs 18, 17. Proverbs 21, 2 says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. You know what you can do, guys, ladies? You know what you can do? You can convince yourself that any anything you want to do is okay. You know, you can do the most outlandish thing, the most unchristian thing. It, it can even be crooked. Um, and you know what? If, if you want to do it bad enough, you, you can convince yourself it's okay. But you know what you have to do to do that? You have to lie to yourself. God said, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 18, 17 says, he that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searches them out. In other words, you know, I'm, I'm on a mission, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to straighten so-and-so out, you know, and, and I'm just, I'm just convinced, you know, I just, Need to give him a piece of my mind. And I, I'm on my way. And um, and here comes Moses. And Moses said, Pastor, I can see it in your face, Pastor. Don't do that. And I go, why? And you know what? And Moses tells me why I shouldn't do it. You know what? Until Moses stopped me, I thought I was just. 
But you know why? Because I wasn't being honest with myself. But my neighbor came and he searched me out. So, you know, these are just some things. Uh, discernment. Learn not to be intimidated. Because what do we want our young men? We want our young men to rightly, not stubbornly, like we talked about last week. But we want them to rightly know where to stand and to stand their ground. So they're not tossed by every wind that comes along. But, you know, a whole lot of that is going to depend on can, can they be honest with themselves. So those are just some, just some simple things tonight. And we'll cover more later. Let's pray. Lord, bless, God bless the truth. And um, Lord, I pray you'd help everyone, but I pray you'd help us, Lord, our, our young men. And as, as they will someday be raising young men, Lord, we're going to have people raising kids in here before long. And God, that they would, they would put something in their young men that would make them, Lord, strong and resilient, Lord, against the lies and the falsehoods and the worldliness and the fads and all that stuff. Something, Lord, that would give them courage. Lord, that they would that they would be thrilled, that they would have the peace and the confidence that comes from having done the reading and having having looked into things and Lord, having sought you and having searched the scriptures, Lord, and having been honest with their own heart. God, give them the courage and the confidence. Let them rejoice in these things, Lord. In Jesus name we pray. I'm going to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord. Thank you for your truth, Lord. Amen. You're dismissed. Remember, if you can help us at Bob's at, uh, you know, 9, 930 on Saturday morning, that would be great. Thank you.